John chapter 3. John chapter 3. Been a, for however long it is that God has me do it, Sunday evenings, we're going to be looking at foundational doctrines. It's important. Far more important than some might think. I mean, not only do we need to be put into remembrance, as the scripture says, number one, but man, I'm telling you, uh, and I'm not exaggerating, uh, the condition of the Church of Jesus Christ all around the world is abysmal. And the stuff that I see being said, things I be seeing being preached, you know, it, it, it's horrendous. It's horrendous. And so, again, I, like I, I mentioned, uh, I, I know several pastors, but this is where God has led them to. Is going back to the basics. The foundational doctrine. Man, it needs it. It needs it. And so that's where we're going to be. And the subject is going to be eternal security. And it's going to be more than one message on that one. Right now, John chapter 3. And in John chapter 3, we're going to be reading verses 14, 15, 16, and verse 36. Let me read that and we'll pray and and I'll share with you what God's given to me. John chapter 3, beginning at verse 14. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world, that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And then the last verse in the chapter, number 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. And he that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him, our Heavenly Father. Lord, you wouldn't think, Father, after 2,000 years of having the gospel of Jesus Christ, 2,000 years of having the Bible as a complete revelation, Lord, that churches would have to be hearing such foundational doctrines. But Lord, we need it just as much, if not more so now, as it was in the first century. Lord, and so I pray, Lord, uh, for those that are here tonight to hear the message, Lord, let it bless their hearts, and strengthen and encourage them. And Lord, as you blessed us with the ability to reach well beyond, Lord, these four walls, Lord, that we have the privilege of meeting in, Lord, indeed, Father, uh, around the entire globe, Lord, we pray, Father, that this will be a blessing and an encouragement to many. Get glory to thyself. We pray and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. And I've had to deal with the topic of assurance of salvation and eternal security many times over the years. Uh, the very first time I remember was when we were in our first church up in Limestone, Maine, and we had a, a, a couple that were also in the Air Force with us at the time, and uh, the fellow who was the song leader for the church was having a crisis of faith. He, he, he wasn't sure he was saved. He didn't, here's to get it, didn't feel saved. And that's, you know, I mean, I saw a post up this week about a fellow going on about how, you know, six years ago, you know, my heart got convicted and I walked down the aisle and I went down and, you know, I prayed what he called the sinner's prayer, or trusted Christ as my Savior. He said, but for six years I've never had the assurance of salvation. I've prayed that prayer many times again and again and again. I didn't feel saved. You know, and then I realized, and this was the thing, this is what the claim, I realized that I was trusting in the fact that I went down the aisle and prayed that prayer. Well, yeah, 
Okay. It takes you making a choice and a decision. Say. Uh, yes, it says believe, believe, believe. Yeah. As soon as you believe in your heart, you're saved, okay? Okay. But what, what happened again, I always go back to Acts with Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> okay. He had believed in his heart before he ever said, Yeah, you know, yes, I believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the only begotten, you know, the only begotten Son of God. You know, because that's what Philip had, you know, he said, What what hindereth me to be baptized? Because I won't be baptized. And he said, well, if thou believest with all thou thy heart, thou man. Well he already believed. Okay? But he still got asked. You know, there's <coughs> And that's, this has been one of the big things, I mean, some of that, the ridiculous, and I mean that when I say it, ridiculous hair splitting that has gone on in, within the churches about salvation. Well, if you don't do this, you're not saved. Well, if you did do this, you aren't saved. And this and that, and that's like, good night. The devil's just having a great time of it while we sit here and cut each other's throats spiritually over and over and over again instead of going out and winning people to Jesus Christ. And again, I've dealt with this, I can't tell you how many times I've had to sit down. And I usually will always, I mean, the, I'm go tell you. When I sat down with, with you out here, then after you prayed, didn't I talk to you and tell you, you know, about having assurance of salvation, that your salvation was secure. Mm -hmm. That's one of the first things I do, because I know that's one of the first things the devil's going to attack. Okay. I did it with Jose and Aaliyah last Sunday when I sat down with them and led them to Jesus Christ. I do that with everybody. Okay. I learned that long ago. I thank God I never had that crisis of faith in my life. Even when I wasn't living for God, you know, for those 20 plus years of stupidity, if somebody had asked me if I was saved, I'd have told them, yeah, I'm saved. I know I'm going to heaven. If there is a salvation, I'd have told people it rests in Jesus Christ and Christ alone and nothing else. I might have been being rebellious. You might not have known I was saved, but I knew enough. I knew the truth. And I thank God I've never questioned it. Now when the Lord turned my attention to foundational doctrine, like I said, you know, this is, you know, every week he's making sure, okay, this is what I want you to, to deal with. He's all, I'm, God is very good with guiding me in things. John 3.16. You know, I mean, even many non-believers can quote John 3.16. It's arguably probably the best known New Testament scripture out there. I mean, there's hardly a sports event that's out there that somebody's done up there with a John 316. You know, uh, you know even if they don't believe it, folks know it. You know. Now, note in verse 15. <clears throat> there you have, Whosoever believeth, not perish, have eternal life. Verse 16. Whosoever believeth, not perish, have everlasting life. Verse 36, he that believeth hath everlasting life. That's a, that, that's a present positive verb. Don't, don't tax my English. That's about as far as I can get with I had to take remedial English in, in college. And uh, I from my wife correcting my spelling all the time. Who knows what you get? You know, throughout the entire chapter, Okay. From verse 1 all the way down to 36. Okay, There is not one provision in there for whosoever believeth that if they do or do not do X, Y, Z, that the deal is off. Okay, And your everlasting, eternal life, that God that cannot lie just promised to you is now null and void. And you are indeed going to perish. <laughs> you don't find it anywhere in the entire chapter. It's not there. It's because you ain't going to find it. <laughs> now before we go any further into the message, I need to establish two important points 
in the discussion. Number one, you cannot deal correctly with the subject of eternal security without doing it dispensationally. Now we just spent, as you all know, 31 weeks on the subject. So I'm not going to be delving into the different dispensations in relation to the subject. It's, it really is irrelevant for what we're doing. What we will be looking at is we're going to look at it from the perspective of eternal security and the assurance of salvation in relation to the current dispensation in which we're living, the dispensation of the Church of Jesus Christ. Number two, okay, we're only talking about those people, okay, who are in the scriptural terms born again, Bible believers. And I'll tell you why I specify those two things. I mean, number one, unless you've been born again according to what the scriptures clearly say, there's no way that the subject can even begin to apply to you. I'm going to talk to you about your eternal security when you don't even have it. Okay. And I mean, you know, here, I mean, here's the problem, okay? Ever since the Vatican II Accords, okay, you can talk to some Catholics; they'll tell you they've been born again. You can you can talk to all kinds of different Protestant groups and all kinds of oh yeah, I've been born again. Okay, it, what do they mean by that? Okay, you can talk to a Mormon. <laughs> You can talk to a Jehovah's Witness, okay? Okay, and there are heretic cults, and they're going to tell you, "Oh yeah, I've been okay." So it's oh, that's why I specify Bible believer, okay? Not your opinions, not your preferences, not your religious dog roll, not what you've tried to make something mean, but what does the Scripture say? Somebody brings that stuff up, but okay, I mean, uh, as far as I go, it's immediately dismissed out of hand. Okay? I don't care about any of that. I don't, you know, what does this say? You know, and I mean, I've heard, I've heard the gamut <laughs> when it comes to that. Okay, now as far as for me, my faith and my confidence stands on the solid rock. And it's absolutely as unshakable as he is. He ain't going to talk me out of my salvation. And quite frankly, I don't waste one moment of time in arguing with fools. Remember that term, it's going to come up in a little bit. Matthew 7, 6 says, Give not that which is holy unto dogs, neither cast ye your pearls before swine, lest they trample them, under their feet and turn again and rend you. Now, the honest inquirer, somebody who truly wants to know or has an honest question, I will always spend time with them. But someone who, you know, is just interested, you know, some fool whose only wish is to argue for argument's sake and is not going to be convinced no matter what amount of scriptural truth is presented. Okay, as far as I'm concerned, they're not worthy of the time. And I don't waste my time with them. And I just rebuke them and be done with you. I don't chase people. You know, I just don't do it. That's, that's my personality. That's my nature. Okay. With right or wrong, that's who I am. God uses me as I am. Not to say that He doesn't work on me, granted. Now I insist on using that terminology of born again Bible believer. Again, because I've, I've dealt with several, as I've said, who have claimed that they are born again. But you're going to find when you question them further, they either cannot or in most cases, will not give a biblical description of their salvation experience, of their new birth. 
know, I give for example uh, our former President Trump one time when he was asked about the, if he was saved, if he was well, he got all indignant and, and that per, to that person and everything, how dare you question my faith? Well, guess what that makes me think? Somebody asked me about my salvation, and let me tell you. <laughs> Let's have a let's spend, let me talk let me tell you about my salvation experience. I, I love to tell the story. Be my I mean really. I can't tell you know how many people this this is the one I get most of the time. Well that's personal. Really? Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, or those that do a lot of times they, they give a description of the process. And it's expressed in non, you know, in non-biblical terms, non-biblical nature. Or in it, they also express having questions, doubts, or downright denial and, and, and unbelief in the truth of the scriptures. Uh, like I say, folks, I've been in 44 years. I've had a lot of conversations with a lot of people and I've heard a lot of stuff. That's why I say it's entirely pointless to discuss eternal security and assurance of salvation with someone who has not been born again according to the words of God. And that's why I, I insist on in what we're talking about here Okay, has to apply to somebody who has been born again, who has been redeemed, who has been washed in the blood of the Lamb according to this book. That's why I say Bible believer. If you don't believe you have the Word of God, <coughs> then how did you get saved? There's always going to be a doubt. I never questioned it. I mean, even as a Roman Catholic, I believed that I had God's Word. Uh, I didn't happen to have a copy of God's <laughs> Word at the time, but it's like I tell folks, you know, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit helps out the new believer. I got saved. I knew I needed to have a Bible. I didn't own one at the time. I found one of them little dinky, tiny Gideon things that, you know, they used to give you when you joined the military. They don't do that anymore. Everybody used to get one. I went out and bought a Bible, and I bought an AD 16 old Bible, because I knew that was the Word of God. Much of the issue with folks doubting their salvation or believing that they can lose their salvation is a result of their not rightly dividing the scriptures according to the dispensations of the Bible. That's why I said you can't have that conversation unless you're going to have it dispensational. Like I say, during our weeks-long study on dispensation and covenants, you were given the meaning of that word dispensation. That is translated from the Greek, the word is translated dispensation, and it simply means how a householder orders, runs, operates their household. You know, I've noticed ever since, you know, I've been putting those up all, you know, I don't know how many, how many months is 31 weeks whatever that works out to. Now there's a bunch of other folks out there now putting up videos and stuff and everything on the dispensations. Mm -hmm. you know? And I see pe folks making dispensations out of things that weren't dispensations. <laughs> that's why that's important that you understand that. You know, one fellow, a good fellow, I like him, nice guy, but he's wrong. Putting up there about you know, the, the, the dispensation of promise. Okay. And he's talking about Abraham. Well, that wasn't a dispensation. That was a covenant that God made. We talked about that in this morning's message. That was a covenant. There's a difference. That he made. Okay. Boy, you, you, you know, I, got, I, I hardly ever comment on Facebook because I found, boy, you make any of them fans, everything just blows up. <laughs> and that's not any place that you can have an intelligent conversation right. with anybody. Because you're not dealing with somebody face to face. I, I don't do it. Anyways, during the dispensation, 
of the church of Jesus Christ. Okay, and this is how God is ordering his household right now. This is how you have righteousness with God is through Jesus Christ. Salvation okay, is by faith. Now I'm going to run through it for the sake of the message. Again, faith is exercised by the individual who is seeking salvation in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, as we went through teaching dispensations, there's always been the element of faith and works. God the Father is satisfied with what Jesus Christ has done, and this is evidenced by Jesus Christ's resurrection from death and hell. Also by the fact of his receiving a glorified body, a renewed spirit, as well as his ascension into heaven and being seated at the right hand of God the Father. God the Father has in turn now offers that salvation to men as a free gift by his grace, the unmerited favor of God. Now, if you believe what God has said, again, that's why I make it a point of you've got to be a Bible believer. How do we know what God said? Here it is. Believe what God said and you exercise faith in this, God has promised you a new birth. Okay? This is a spiritual birth, and the active agent in the process is the Holy Spirit of God. Now, you know what the elements involved back in our text. Faith works grace, free gift. And when these elements all come together, it's the Holy Spirit of God who performs the transaction. Okay, you've done this. Amen. The Lord's done his part. You've done your part. You're born again. Now we come to the territory that we want to talk about. Eternal security. Matthew chapter 7. We were there this morning. Over there. Matthew 7, 21, 22, 23. Matthew 7, 21, 22, 23. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have cast out devils. And in thy name done many wonderful works. And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. A lot of folks will go to this and say, see, you can lose your salvation. What's the context? What's the context? Who's speaking? Yeah. Okay, number one, it's the mortal Jesus Christ, the man, okay, the son of man, who declared himself to be the promised Jewish Messiah, and whose message is to Israel, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. That's our context. There's no Gentile present unless there are a Jewish proselyte who has voluntarily put themselves under the law of Moses to obtain righteousness. When we were studying the dispensations, we came to that understanding that no Gentile was required to put themselves under the law of Moses. They remained under conscience until the coming of Jesus Christ. The same as the Jews, the Jews alone. They were under the law of Moses until the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you could choose to, and many did. And in fact, that was one of the responsibilities of the nation of Israel, of the Jewish people, was to be a light to the Gentiles. Okay, at this point that we're reading right here, Jesus Christ is three years away from his death on the cross, suffering in hell and resurrection from the dead. Okay. The Old Testament is still in force. New Testament isn't even declared until Matthew 26. Over there. Matthew 26. Matthew 26, verse 26 to 28. And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to the disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body. 
And he took the cup and gave thanks and gave it to them, saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But what's it say over in Hebrews? It says, Testament's not in force until you have the death of the testator. He ain't dead yet. This is this is the Last Supper. And it's not in force yet. In fact, it doesn't come into force until Matthew 29, 16. Yeah, Matthew 29. Yeah, you can't go to Matthew 29. There ain't no Matthew 29. <laughs> <laughs> All right, never mind that. 16 through 20, Matthew 28. i got to get a new pen. I'm telling you. All right. <laughs> I, I, I'm, I'm kidding. I'm making a thing. The pen made the mistake. Oh. Couldn't have been me. Okay. Not brainless me. Okay. <laughs> then the eleven disciples went away into Galilee to a mountain where Jesus had appointed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all way, even unto the end of the world. Amen. This is at the ascension of Lord Jesus Christ back into heaven to be seated at the right hand of God the Father after walking on this earth okay, for 40 days so that people would see him. So 500 witnesses, it says in that. So, doesn't even come into effect there. Nobody Nobody's called a Christian until Acts 11.26 where it says they were called Christians first in Antioch. That is several years after Jesus Christ's ascension into heaven. Matthew 7 has the Lord speaking to an audience of kingdom-seeking, law-keeping Jews. And how God is dealing with them under the dispensation of the law of Moses. You can't make that apply to a born-again Bible believer. But they do, because they can't rightly divide the word of truth. Well, I don't think you can cut the Bible up in a bunch of... And it ain't all written to you, I'm sorry. As I've heard people say before, quit reading other people's mail. It's not written to you. You can't make it apply to you. You're not going to find one reference to any born-again individual who's been redeemed because they're believing in the finished work of the Lord Jesus Christ over there in Matthew chapter 7. Okay. I mean, that's still three years away before he even goes through Calvary. How about Matthew 5, 22? That's another one that gets brought up. That's why knowing this is so important. Matthew 5, 22. I've had this one personally given to me by people. But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. And whosoever shall say to his brother, Rock, shall be in danger of the council. But whosoever shall say, Thou fool, so I told you to remember that, shall be in danger of hellfire. Well, first of all, okay, now we're in Matthew chapter 5. We're still in the same context. Two chapters earlier. Same context as where we were in Matthew 7. Notice how the sin ratchets up here by degrees. Angry. Okay, angry with your brother. How about Proverbs 22:24? Proverbs 22, 24. The father... Oops, wrong one. 22, 24. There we are. Make no friendship with an angry man and with a furious man. Thou shalt not go. Okay, Proverbs, Old Testament. Proverbs 29, 22. Proverbs 29, 22. An angry man stirreth up strife. And a furious man abounded in transgression. Okay. You 
anger with his brother without a cause. Okay? You can be angry, and okay? the Bible says be angry and sin not. There are, right, there, are, there are right reasons that you can be angry. Don't let it become sin. But then it ratchets up to calling, saying somebody, ah. well, what does that mean? <laughs> well, if you take it as a literal translation out of the Hebrew, it means it's something that's mixed or mingled. So what are you saying to somebody? Okay, you're, You've got a confused, mixed up mind is what you're saying. That's going one step beyond just being angry. Now your name calls. Then it says, you know, oh, well, thou fool. Danger of hellfire. You know. Why? Why why does he say